I appreciate that someone recognized the origin of this name. I uh, had to spend a lot of time explaining it to people who are not from the US why this was the perfect name for feature engineering. Um, so yeah, so I'm uh, Liam McGuire. I'm a principal member of technical staff at Salesforce, working on Salesforce Einstein. Uh, I've mostly worked on our uh, AutoML initiatives. And my name is Mario Powell. I also work in the Salesforce Einstein platform. I manage our automated machine learning product initiative. And today, just like Leah said, we're gonna talk about our magical feature engineering process called transmogrification. So before we get started, you all know that Salesforce is a publicly traded company. We have a very active legal team. So this is a forward-looking statement. Long story short, don't buy Salesforce stocks just based upon the session, all right? <laughs> <laughs> With that out of the way, let's get started. Right, so um, let's presume for a moment that your data store is represented by this closet. Um, if that's the case, then I'm gonna say lucky you. Your data store looks really nice. Things are where they're supposed to be. You have some indication of what they're supposed to do based on their location and everything appears to be filled out. Um, but like uh, your actual data store, this closet, or like this closet, your actual data store basically looks nothing like what you want to feed into a machine learning model. So machine learning models generally expect some sort of numeric input um, into uh, the algorithm that's actually going to make the prediction. And in order to get from something like this um, closet or your data store, you're gonna have to do a lot of steps. And it's, it's surprisingly few uh, steps different to go from something like a closet than it is to go from something like a data store. So raw logs require m a lot of work in order to create actual features from them. And this is made uh, worse by the fact that most people's data stores don't look like that, they look like this, right? So, so you, May, may not know where to find things, things are not necessarily in the place, they're not filled out. Um, you, you have to do some detective work in order to figure out what the right use for different, different pieces of information are. Um, and so as you can imagine, this is a very labor-intensive process. This is actually, I would say, where most of the work in feature engineering um, or in machine learning ends up happening, is in, in the feature engineering. So to make things slightly harder, so Salesforce is an enterprise company, so we are a B2B company. Our customers are other businesses, so each of them brings their own messy, unclean closet. And so we have to spend a lot of time to do feature engineering, ETL, and processing of the data. Another important thing that I wanna mention, which most people don't understand in the enterprise space is, since each of these businesses have their own data, we cannot commingle that data, because it's a trust issue, it's a privacy issue. Uh, imagine using Google data for Uber and vice versa, you know, there would be a lot of problems there. So we have to figure out that how can we, based upon the type of the data and the shape of the data, what kind of feature engineering process that we can do. Also, because we have hundreds of such customers in business, like setting and hand tuning and doing feature engineering for those individual closets of data does, just does not scale. So we have to sort to different methods. Mm -hmm. And today, machine learning algorithms take the center stage in AI. You know, like every company has been spending a lot of time in improving their algorithms. Uh, I always see that there's a research or some research paper where they're trying to get a fraction of a percentage above some other algorithm as, uh, as it comes to accuracy. However, what we see in the real world, especially in the enterprise space, the bottleneck is not really in the modeling algorithms. The bottleneck is actually feeding the data into those algorithms. So we have invested a lot of time in doing our own feature engineering process. So Leah would talk more about that. Right, so if you think about what a machine learning algorithm wants, it wants something like this. You've got a nice, clean, numeric input that you use to predict some particular label. So in this case, it's a categorical label. And the question is, of course, how do you get from some data that may be unrelated into this numeric output? And the answer is that it really depends on the particular data that you're inputting, right? So you have to customize how you do your feature engineering to the data that you see. And this is what most of a data scientist's time is spent on. And the way they do this is they look at sort of the shape of the data, the, the distribution, the size of the data, how much of that data is filled in. Color is a little bit of a stretch, but you get the general idea. Like you're really digging deep into what that data is. So you can think of color as something like the type of the data, right? Um, and so this metadata-driven feature engineering is very common what we do in Salesforce. So here is a snapshot, like based upon the type of the feature, we are doing different kind of feature engineering process automatically. For instance, if the feature is numeric, we would do imputation, we would track null values, we would scale and do log normalization based upon the type of the numeric feature that is. We would do smart bidding. Smart bidding is interesting because these are numeric features, we are not just bucketizing the features manually, but based upon the information gain, with respect to the label, we would automatically figure out buckets. 
When it comes to categorical features, we would do similar transformations. In addition, we would do one-hot encoding. Um, if there's a lot of different categorical values available, we would do dynamic top K pivot. When it comes to text features, hashing is very common. We would do TFIDF and word embeddings. Uh, we would also do sentiment analysis on some of this text, and language detection is also very important because some of this text, based upon the language, how you're doing feature engineering really depends. The, la the next one is temporal. This is a time-based feature, so, which is actually very important. <laughs> so we do things like time difference. If your time feature has seasonality in it, so seasonal importance, we would do circular statistics to actually capture those signals. Uh, also, closeness to major events is another custom feature engineering that we do in order to capture seasonality and events uh, which are actually captured in some of these time-based features. Lastly, we have spatial features. Uh, Geoencoding is very common. Some of the more interesting research that we are doing is can we augment your spatial features with external data? For example, imagine zip code. So based upon zip code, you can actually draw in uh, information about demographics or income, and that might have a different signal and might help in your feature engineering process. And finally, in the modeling process. Right, and so a lot of what we've been doing in our AutoML efforts at Salesforce is figuring out how, how to pack all of that information that you saw on the last slide into this single line of code, right? So this line basically takes in a set of, of features and we'll do feature engineering on them of the appropriate type uh, with the appropriate outputs in order to produce a single numeric vector that gets fed into things. And what this code is doing underneath the hood is basically a first order sort on the individual type of the feature. So Salesforce has a rich type system. Basically it has a type like email, it has a type like phone. It doesn't just give you text. And so we use that information to say, all right, I'm gonna treat this like an email and I'm going to go ahead and look at it and say, is it a valid email address? And if it is, then I'll go ahead and parse it into prefix and domain. And then I might go ahead and say, all right, I want the top 10 most common email domains and I'm gonna figure out which one each individual email uh, belongs to and so I'll pivot it. And similarly, we do uh, appropriate uh, treatments for phone number based on the distributions that we see. Age, we might look at it and say, all right, is this better treated as a continuous numeric variable or do I actually want to bucketize it in order to feed into my, to my model? And so we do all of this automatically for every single customer in order to feed things into our feature vector. Um, and what this means is that we've got a very wide and rich feature vector uh, which will produce good models um, but of course, this introduces some compu uh, complications, which is the subject of our next talk. Yeah, so this was a short talk where we wanted to give you a sneak peek into our feature engineering process. The process is very magical, no doubt about that, but it also creates complexities when it comes to interpreting those features because one of the things that we have to do is not just have the best model, but how do we actually make the model explainable? So that's kind of what we're gonna talk about in our next talk, which is the black swan of perfectly interpretable models. We'll say what interpretability is all about, why do you need it, and what are the different solution approaches so that you can make your model explainable. So we're looking forward to the next talk. Don't run away. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? All right, thanks.